everybody. Recording live from somewhere. This is Zach Couples with episode number 119 of the Movement Debrief. And today, folks, is going to be kicking. Everyone leave because of the bad pun. Because we're going to talk about all things related to the foot. Yes, folks, this would be a debrief that Quentin Tarantino would be proud of. Because I got a bunch of questions that have been asked by the people. They will be answered for the people by this people right here, fam recognized fam. Without further ado, let's debrief, shall we? The first question comes from lead mentee fambro Dana. Here's what Dana writes. I am also confused with foot position. If your feet supinate, are you using an inhalation strategy? If you pronate, are you using an exhalation strategy? With this question, what Dana is referring to is what is the foot position that's associated with normal respiratory mechanics? Your whole body has relative motion every time you take a breath of air in and a breath of air out. And in order to simplify processes instead of going like flexion, abduction, external rotation, internal rotation, like all of this stuff, if we can create a dichotomy between two particular strategies, inhalation, exhalation, or if we want to talk about contractile properties, eccentric versus concentric, that's what we're trying to do. This is in order to simplify things, which again, there's a little bit of learning curve, I understand, but inhalation versus exhalation. What is the position of the foot? With inhalation mechanics, that's associated with total body expansion. The reason why it's associated with total body expansion is because as you breathe in, you have to make room for this air that's accumulating in the lungs. There has to be expansive actions that occur throughout the body. The rotation that is associated with expansion is external rotation. Think about if you were to internally rotate your body. Everything gets closer together and I don't expand my body out like I would normally if we're talking about external rotation. What then is external rotation and internal rotation when we're talking about the foot? External rotation would be, in this case, supination of the foot, and then internal rotation would be pronation of the foot. Why is that the case? Well, I'm glad you asked. The reason why supination is associated with inhalation is because movements that are occurring at the foot when I supinate are plantar flexion and inversion. When I do those movements, that creates expansive properties in the body. The foot is moving away from the midline to some degree and life is good. You are, you are getting an expansive action, right? So in, think about this. If you externally rotate your leg, go ahead and do it. Where does your foot go? Your foot should supinate. The medial border of your foot should lift off of the ground. That's why supination is associated with inhalation mechanics. And that's the combined action of plantar flexion inversion. Think about this. You know that your boy has been really big on elevating heels during a squat. Why is that useful? The reason why that's useful is because when I elevate the heels, the foot falls into plantar flexion. If plantar flexion and inversion go together, that means that this biases the foot into an inhalation strategy. Now, what type of strategy is a squat? Oh my gosh, it's inhalation based. So that can be another reason why elevating the heels could be useful for improving your squat depth is because it's biasing inhalation mechanics at one part of the body. On the flip side, let's talk about exhalation mechanics. Pronation is associated with exhalation mechanics because I have, if supination is plantar flexion inversion, with pronation I'm going to have dorsiflexion and eversion, meaning the foot's going to collapse inward. Same process, if you drive your knee in to internal rotation, your foot is going to collapse associated with exhalation based mechanics. Let's look at another favorite lower body activity, such as the deadlift. Why is it that it's easier 
to pull some heavy ass weights off the ground. Thank you, Ryan Coleman. If your foot's flat or you're barefoot or you're wearing chucks versus if you're wearing Olympic lifting shoes or high heels. Kids don't try it at home. The reason why, possibly, is because if the foot is flatter, I might be biasing more exhalation-based mechanics because the foot is going to be more relatively dorsiflexed and everted compared to if you had some type of heel lift. Since the hinge, or a deadlift, is a more exhalation-biased activity, I can bias foot position to promote the mechanics that I desire so I can lift heavy ass weights off the ground. And those are the reasons why inhalation is associated with supination, exhalation is associated with pronation. You just need to follow um, what the foot is going to be doing in relation to the femur. To summarize your great question, Dana, my lead mentee, Fambro, inhalation, supination, plantar flexion inversion, those are paired together. Because with inhalation, I have gross external rotation throughout the body to create the necessary expansion to take air into the lungs. Elvis Presley, your knee out, you should see that your foot should begin to supinate. Exhalation is associated with pronation, dorsiflexion, eversion, and internal rotation throughout the body because as I internally rotate, I compress, I make myself smaller, I generate tension to evacuate air. And if you want to demonstrate that, just drive your knee inward. You're going to see that your foot's going to follow suit and drive into pronation. The next question also comes from my girl, Dana. Here's question number two from Dana. Looking at pelvic position and foot position, would banded squats be a good exercise for someone who is a crazy chronic supinator? This would drive hip femur abduction to encourage pronation at the foot. And with chronic pronators, squats with adductor squeeze, squeezing something between the knees, would that drive femoral adduction to allow for supination? How would this fit with a narrow ISA with supination? So with this question, Dana, if we go back to what we discussed before, supination is associated with inhalation, pronation is associated with exhalation, we'd have to flip-flop those two strategies. If I want to drive more supination at the foot, it would make more sense to place a band around the knees to drive a slight amount of abduction external rotation. You don't want to go wild and crazy knees out or anything like that because what will happen in that case is you're probably going to drive some superficial concentric activity in the posterior aspect of the body because the more you externally rotate, the more the big dog, glute max, has leverage. If the glute max has leverage and I'm trying to do something like a squat, the glute has to be able to eccentrically orient to get the full hip flexion that is so desired. If you can't do that, you're going to cheat in some way, some shape, some form. But using a band to just keep the femurs relatively fixed and drive a slight amount of external rotation can be useful. If I have that band there as a cue to not drive the knees out or not let the knees collapse in, I can drive further dynamics at the pelvis. It can be a really useful external cue for someone to work with in order to maximize movement options in a move such as a squat. If you need to increase supination, think about a band around the knees. If you need pronation, that type of person is where we might consider doing an adductor squeeze for the reasons we talked about before. If I'm driving my knees inward into adduction and internal rotation, that's going to increase foot pronation. Now let's extrapolate this to a base level narrow versus wide infrasternal angle because Dana did talk about this. With a narrow infrasternal angle, because that is more of a inhalation bias at the spine, there's going to be more relative external rotation throughout the body, that person may be more predisposed to being a supinator, which is why in the beginning, if your goal is to teach a narrow ISA, normal respiratory mechanics, and you want to do a stack, oftentimes we will cue a squeeze of the knees to open up the infrapubic angle. So if I'm narrow infrasternal angle, 
the movement bias is going to also have a narrow IPA, infrapubic angle. My favorite IPA to drink. I need to do things to open up that infrapubic angle. Doing a squeeze between the knees, if you please, is going to get the adductors to kick in. Since the adductors attach to the, the pubis, it's going to pull these puppies apart. Hence why a squeeze can be useful for a narrow ISA. We can also extrapolate that to the foot. If I have more of this abduction, external rotation, inhalation bias, the foot's going to be more supinated, and I'm going to need to drive pronation, which is an exhalation strategy. That's where the squeeze comes into play. Now you're probably wondering, well, Zach, I've seen some narrow infrasternal angle peeps who have flat feet. What's going on with that? If you see someone who has a narrow infrasternal angle and they're using an exhalation strategy, that would be a progression of compensation. If the initial compensatory action is to drive a inhalation bias, meaning I'm going to externally rotate everything, and they go too far down that route and they're trying to right back to center, they could do something like pronate the foot to compensate and drive some degree of exhalation bias. So this would be kind of a layer thing. You, you kind of want to think of it as, a, uh, as this back and forth tug of war dynamic. And Bill, which I'll link this in the show notes, which will be found on zackcouples.com forward slash foot. But Bill had this excellent video on Instagram that I want you to check out where he talks about how you have this, this back and forth uh, tug of war action, so to speak, of driving certain inhalation biases versus exhalation biases. And really all it is is to keep yourself upright. So if I'm a narrow infrasternal angle, for example, we know that the pelvis is going to be more counter-nutated. That's going to direct us to falling more backward. I might do activities on the front side of the body to right that the other way, right? So that would bring me forward. I might make more concentric action on the front side of the body which would be where you get this inhalation bias at the spine or an exhalation bias on the front side of the body, if you could think of it that way. And then you might do things to, if I go too far the other direction, right myself back up to center. Same principle applies at the foot. If Nate Dogg and Warren G were physical therapists, Nate Dogg and Warren G had to supinate. You might supinate too far, body thinks, uh-oh, crap, I'm going to be falling, I need to not do this, you could create a secondary compensation into pronation, and perhaps this doesn't occur at the pelvis and the femurs, but it could occur at the, uh, at the, the tibio-femoral joint. So you have a situation where I could have femoral external rotation, tibial internal rotation, and then the foot falls into pronation. That might be an example of a secondary compensation. We went on a little bit of a tangent. Let me bring it back to center. A narrow infrasternal angle is going to have more of an inhalation bias. That's going to be associated with external rotation and supination. You want to drive things to go the other way. So I'm going to drive pronation-based activities and adduction-based activities and IR-based activities. If you see a narrow doing an exhalation strategy, which would be dorsiflexion eversion at the foot, pronation, you know that's a secondary compensation. Let's now look at the wide infrasternal angle. A wide infrasternal angle has an exhalation bias to start. In that case, if exhalation is associated with internal rotation, a deduction, they're going to have more of a pronated foot. The band is going to be useful from a pelvis perspective because if I'm a wide ISA and I have subsequently a wide IPA, I don't want to do the squeeze because all the squeeze is going to do is kick in the adductors more and attempt to pull the IPA, the infrapubic angle, open further. I need to do things to close the infrapubic angle. That's where a band's going to come into play because if I kick in my abductors and external rotators, that's going to take muscles like your gluteus medius, tensor fascia lata, my favorite thing to order at Starbucks, glute min, and pull the inlets apart from looking at it from where the muscles attach, which would subsequently narrow the infrapubic angle. With them, you want to drive more supination-based activities. What if I have a wide ISA who's got a supinated foot? Then you're dealing with secondary compensation. They went too far down. 
the exhalation side of things and they got to bring it back to the middle. So what do they do? They do a compensation through the foot, whether that's through driving, you know, most likely driving tibiofemoral external rotation and that allows the foot to supinate to some degree. All of these secondary compensations are ways to bring back to center, but they result in a subsequent loss of movement options. To summarize Dana's great, amazing, outstanding question, if I want to drive supination, band around the knees. If I want to drive pronation, something between the knees, and please squeeze. Narrow infrasternal angle, first layer of compensation is going to be more supination bias, which is one, another reason why you're driving an adductor squeeze. Wide ISAs are going to be more pronation biased, hence why a band around the knees performing slight abduction and external rotation, but not so much that your glute max in it, can be useful. If you see the, the other compensation, so a narrow has a flat foot or a wide has a supinated foot, you're dealing with secondary compensatory actions. You probably need to address those earlier in the game and you would just follow similar recommendations as you would for the other person. If I have a narrow ISA who's got a pronated foot, I still might do the squeeze to change the mechanics up at the pelvis, but what I may do locally at the foot is drive actual supination, so you're creating this opposite twist. Same thing with a wide infrasternal angle. If I'm a wide ISA and I got a supinated foot, what I may do is I may band around the knee, but then start to drive pronation. And if you do those things, you ought to be in business. Awesome question, Dana. The next question comes from Ray, or as I might say, Ray Ray, Uncle Ray Ray. If you get that reference, you have 37 bonus points for me, which we should keep track of bonus points. Hey Zach, in your foot discussion on Instagram Live tomorrow, today, do you think you can address flat feet and how you may be able to manage it to be efficient in lifting, running, etc.? I can have a flat foot one of two ways. I can either have a flat foot strategy that is driven by the subtalar joint, or I can have a compensation that occurs in the midfoot forefoot proper. Let's break that down. The uh, subtalar joint flat foot is a pretty easy sell. If the subtalar joint is going to be more everted, the inner part of the foot or the arch is going to be plastered down into the ground, hence you have a flat foot. For those folks, a lot of the strategies that we discussed to drive supination would be extremely useful. So what you might do in this case is you would perhaps do your banded squats and drive a little bit of supination, cue some outside heel contact to drive the calcaneus into more inversion. That would be on an exercise standpoint. If, let's say, you know, you try exercise, but you're just not getting the results that you desire, you could look into either getting some more supportive shoes, which I'll link, um, the, you know, PRI has a really good shoe list, so I would link that in the show notes and check that out. And they, they do a good job of breaking down who needs what, and it's, you know, it's a great resource, so check that out. That would be like step one if exercise fails. Step two would be if you exercise fails, you got the shoes, but you're not getting the foot changes you desire. Or you could also argue that this is step one because it's even more conservative. You could utilize heel wedges and um, arch supports. So I don't, I don't have any, but I will link some in the show notes. If I have someone who's got an everted calcaneus, I could put a heel wedge on the inner aspect of the calcaneus, which would tip them back to center. Then you could kick it up a notch by putting a arch pad in there as well to prop the foot into a less flat position. The third situation would be getting someone into, into orthotics. That I would look into a podiatrist who you trust. Again, I, it's been a while since I've ordered orthotics, but I have. there's this guy that you can order them from in, uh, I think he's in Iowa, his name's Dr. Paul Coffin. He does great work. Um, I would strongly look into him. I'll link him in the show notes as well. And that's usually like the order of progression from least aggressive to most aggressive. So exercise first and foremost, 
then you might do wedges and arch pads. You could do shoe. You could do shoe plus wedges and arch pads. You could do shoe plus orthotics. With all of this being said from a treatment standpoint, realize that you're not going to change the structure of the foot. There's likely some genetic predispositions as to why someone has flat feet. Same thing with why someone may not have a flat foot. There's a structural bias we have and we can't necessarily overcome that. And that's okay. All that these interventions are helping you do is they're helping you maximize your movement options so that's not all you have. If I got someone who's got a flat foot, who's got an everted calcaneus and a pancake foot, I want to teach them to go the opposite direction or at least have that movement capacity with the hope being that all movement options are maximized there and they're not stressing certain tissues by being in this flat foot position. And each of those interventions that I outlined, that step-by-step -step sequence, is a way that you can incorporate that. And there's other exercises that you could look at that would be based off of other areas. You just have to figure out what's going to be the biggest area that you would consider influencing when driving foot supination and pronation. This is assuming that you have uh, the ability to achieve a stacked position at the thorax. As I said, if you can't stack, don't talk to Zach but you want to make sure you can posteriorly tilt the pelvis, you can get a full exhalation, all of that stuff, and you're restoring movement options as best as you can throughout the body. Go with a more systemic strategy first, then you start to look local. And that's where the foot progression that I outlined to you, for someone who's got an everted calcaneus and that's how they have their flat foot, that's when that's useful. Let's look at the other way that I could have a flat foot. You could also have a flat foot if the foot is supinated. Well, wait a minute. If the foot is supinated, then the forefoot's going to be locked in place and it should be in more of a, a supinated position because the calcaneus is inverted. When I invert the calcaneus, the midfoot forefoot is locked and it doesn't allow for that collapsing of the arch. Well, folks, in some individuals, you can have a situation where the first ray can plantar flex to contact the ground. Think of this as a secondary consequence that your body might do to ride it back to center. I'm supinating. My calcaneus is inverted. Oh snap, I'm going to fall and I'm going to break my ankle or sprain my ankle or do something nuts to myself. I don't want that to happen. What can be the secondary measure to prevent that? You drop the first ray down towards the ground, Charlie Brown that could create some semblance of a flatter foot position to ensure you have ground contact. It might not be as flat as the person who's got an everted calcaneus, but I could totally envision it being flat enough. What would you do for that person? You would have to reorient that relationship. It still starts with all of the systemic proximal stuff that we talk about ad nauseum on the movement debrief. So make sure you get the stack, you're driving inhalation mechanics, you're driving exhalation mechanics. Once you've done that and you're ready to go to the foot, I actually need to drive calcaneal eversion because the flatness that's happening in the midfoot forefoot is a secondary consequence. So you have to be able to fix the primary consequence or compensation, which would be the supination first. So I'm actually going to drive calcaneal eversion. But in order to untwist the top part of the foot, what I might actually do is pronate the foot, but then I might externally rotate at the femur and tibia so I also don't drive the exact opposite nasty strategy that I want, which would be driving the, the pancake foot that we talked about before. If I pronate or evert my calcaneus and then I bring my knee back to center with femoral external rotation, that sort of serves as an untwisting mechanism at the foot. So you drive a crazy amount of motion into, into eversion first and then I bring myself back to center so I can create an untwist of the foot so to speak. If the foot is inverted and then I'm twisting through the midfoot forefoot, the crazy amount of adduction internal rotation is going to allow the calcaneus to go to center and then when I right myself back to midline but keep 
me sensing my arch and medial heel, that's going to untwist the forefoot. Exercises I like, I do a lot of lunges to drive both of this. I'll link some of my favorites in the show notes. What do you do if exercise fails? We would go through a similar mechanism as we did with the everted calcaneus, only this time we're going to change where we put stuff. If I have a inverted calcaneus in a plantar flex first ray, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a heel wedge on the lateral aspect of the heel to tip the calcaneus towards center. And then in this case, I could justify putting an arch support in as well. Because now I'm going to drive pronation that I need, but I'm not going to do it just through the midfoot, forefoot. I'm going to do it with the calcaneus on board. That would be piece one. Piece two would be to find a shoe that helps that person achieve a, a better movement options. Piece three would be shoe plus the wedges. Piece four would be orthotics. And, and that's usually the, the, the process that I go through when I'm working with someone and improving their, their foot dynamics, especially if they have a flat foot. To give you some numbers though, how often am I doing this? I've probably referred someone for orthotics one or two times in the last couple of years, and I've seen a few people in my day. Um, and in terms of wedges, maybe one, one to two people every few months. So it's not as much as you think. I would strongly encourage you to make sure that you're really emphasizing the exercise side of things. Because one issue that we, we fall into, and I, and I say this as a person who has fallen into it multiple times, is we go through a lot of excessive treatments without mastering the basics. I wouldn't have you play Bach on the piano before you could do chopsticks. Apply the same principle to movement. You need to make sure you can stack, you need to make sure you can put your body in positions it needs to before you go doing things to, to help facilitate that. It's only when a person can't achieve what you're trying to get them achieve, to achieve on their own, despite your best coaching, despite manual interventions, that you would want to go into some of these other treatments for the foot. To summarize your amazing question, you can have a flat foot one of two ways. It's either with an everted calcaneus or an inverted calcaneus with a plantar flexed first ray. First line of defense is always going to be exercise, and you're basically going to give that person the exact opposite strategy that you tried. It, with the goal being to improve movement options, not necessarily to change foot structure. If I got the everted calcaneus, I want to do things that invert the calcaneus. If I have the inverted calcaneus with the plantar flexed first ray, I'm going to do things that evert the calcaneus and then dorsiflex the first ray. Untwist a foot. You can do that with exercise. Please start there first. Exhaust it as long as you can but then you can utilize wedges, shoes, orthotics also to drive that if the person cannot achieve the positions you need them to on their own, or they can get in the positions, but they need that extra bit of sauce to be able to get the changes to stick more effectively. Amazing question. The next question comes from Gregory. Here's what Gregory asks. Do you mind explaining either here on a debrief well, why calcaneal movement drives such profound changes or capacity for one to increase their squat depth? Much appreciated as always. Amazing question. Yes, the calcaneus is really useful when I do a squat. And I talked about this a little bit before in the show, but let's dive in again. Why is the calcaneus important? If I look at a squat, a squat has more of an inhalation bias to it if I compare that to a hinge. The way I classify a squat is I need, of the pelvis, vertical displacement to occur. That's how you're going to get the ATG as to grass type of squat. What I don't want is the hips to shoot back. I would classify that as a hinge. That's just the way I'm going to classify things, right? So a box squat or a powerlifting squat is going to be more hinge-like than, say, a front squat by an Olympic lifter who drops straight down. Right? Even though they're called a squat, this is how I'm differentiating the two movements. Squat, vertical displacement, hinge, posterior displacement. At the pelvis proper, 
for a squat, I'm going to have more counternutation at the sacrum. That's going to concentrically orient or contract the posterior pelvic floor. And then the anterior pelvic floor is going to eccentrically orient. And that's what allows me to drop straight down. Because if the backside, if the backside's blocked, you can't push through it. You gotta nutate if you want to push through it. Counternutation, posterior pelvic floor is concentric, anterior pelvic floor is eccentric. What happens at the extremities? With squatting, although there is some oscillation between external and internal rotation, if the squat is more inhalation biased, overall there's going to be more external rotation occurring at the extremities. External rotation at the extremities is going to be associated with supination of the foot. That's going to be plantar flexion and inversion, and at the calcaneus, the calcaneus is going to be more inverted. Now is the question, why is it that calcaneal movement can drive profound changes? Well, let's look at when I have an issue with calcaneal movement that makes my squat look funky. Have you ever seen someone when they squat turn their feet out or their feet collapse to the nth degree, they pancake down? Those would be two very relevant examples of a situation where I drive a more exhalation or pronation strategy with my squat. What could be some of the negative implications of that or things you might see? You might see this type of person shoot the hips back and use more of an exhalation strategy. You could see them go all the way down but their spine stays flat, which again would be a compensatory exhalation strategy. Or it, maybe it looks good but because their foot is flat, they don't have any power to ascend out of the bottom of a squat because they, they have a, foot, a flat foot. They, they don't have enough sturdiness from the inversion and supination to push out of the bottom well. So perhaps they get plastered in the bottom or they can't get through the sticking point. Those could be some issues you might see with someone who has a more exhaled or pronated foot. So then why is supination powerful? Supination or calcaneal inversion is powerful because it allows the entire, the, the entire lower extremities to coordinate more effectively into an inhalation bias. If I begin to supinate my midfoot and I invert my calcaneus, the rest of the extremities ought to fall into more external rotation. If the extremities are going to externally rotate, I'm going to have more of a counter-nutated position in the pelvis, or at least I'll have the potential to do so. And that should allow me to have better vertical displacement as I go up and down in a squat. That's why it can be so powerful. I remember for myself, this was when I was with Memphis, and uh, my boy, Eric Otter, who is one of my biggest coaching influences, I would link you to him, but he is uh, incognito on the uh, internets. But uh, I was pancaking as I would go down into a squat. So my foot would go flat, I'd turn my feet out, I would pronate. And what he had me do initially was drive active supination as I went up and down in a squat, and that felt better. But what felt even better than that was getting me an Olympic lifting shoe. Because due to the nature of Olympic lifting shoes, when you have a heel wedge, your foot's going to fall into more plantar flexion and inversion. Those movements are paired together. That's going to drive more inhalation mechanics. That's going to allow you to have more vertical displacement of the pelvis. That's going to allow your squat to be like, whoa. And that's why the calcaneal movement is so impactful when we're talking about a squat. And if we're not talking about a squat, we're talking about a hinge. If you drive more exhalation mechanics, you should hinge more effectively. It's another reason why you probably want to do some hinging barefoot or using Chuck Taylors. Not that Chuck Taylors are sponsoring Big Z, but I would love if they did because, you know, hey, it's quarantine, you need money. Anyways, that's why the foot is so powerful or is at least a powerful component when we're talking about maximizing your movements that you choose in the lower body. To summarize your great question, Greg. Supination inversion is associated with inhalation mechanics. I need inhalation mechanics when I drop down into a squat 
because that's associated with counternutation of the sacrum and creates subsequent vertical displacement of the pelvis. If you don't have that, you're going to use some type of exhalation strategy when you should be inhaling. If you're going to exhale when you inhale, you're going to have a bad time. You want to make sure you can do everything you can to drive that inhalation strategy throughout the squat. An easy way to do that would be to elevate the heel, either utilizing a ramp, which my boy Levi makes some amazing ramps. I will link him in the show notes. He is, I don't get paid for him, but he, um, you know, to preface that, he did give me a free ramp because he's a nice guy. But um, I strongly encourage you, like, I, I just think they're awesome ramps. So please check him out. Um, and he, he's reasonably priced, own business, great. Use a ramp, or if you don't want to spend uh, the money to get a ramp, get Olympic lifting shoes. That would drive the same mechanics because the foot's going to be more plantar flexed and inverted since those movements are paired together. An inverted calcaneus is associated with inhalation mechanics, and it's associated with your squat gains going to the next level. Awesome question. The last question comes from Andrew. Here's what Andrew asks. I often see a foot resting in plantar flexion, but also with a bunion. I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around this, as I think of a plantar flexed foot as in supination and associated with a bunion with a pronated foot. Please help. I will help. There's two really good articles that deep dive into bunions. And one of them is called Bunions Overview. It's really short. I think you'll like it. And then the other one, which I really like, is I think it's like called Pathophysiology of um, Bunions or something like that. It's like from 1994, but it's really good. And yeah, okay, it's old, you know, hashtag EBP, police coming to arrest you, boy. But you know what I say? Illmatic came out in the early 90s and it's still awesome. So just because an article was written in a, in a uh, earlier part of our lives doesn't mean that it's not useful. And, and really, I couldn't find anything more up to date. But those would be the two articles. Please check them out. I'm not going to get into the weeds as much with the specific things that happen in the tissues with bunions. But let's talk about what's going on with a bunion. And I think a great way to understand bunions is to actually look at another area that could mimic a bunion. A bunion is basically a valgus deformity that happens at the foot. A lot of times what you'll see is this on the uh, inner part of the, the big toe, you'll see this, this bumpy, bony thing, and then your big toe is going to point laterally. So it looks like a, uh, like a less than sign or, or deuces. So we have to think of another situation of, well, when do I have a valgus deformity in the body elsewhere? A great answer is the knee. We've seen people who have a valgus deformity at the knee. What's going on from a biomechanical standpoint? A gapping in the medial aspect of the knee. That's going to be associated with, at the femur, a deduction and internal rotation, which is what? Exhalation mechanics, ladies and gentlemen. And then I'm going to actually have uh, dorsiflexion and eversion at the foot, which is associated with exhalation mechanics. And that's usually when you see these crazy valgus collapse. It's like the foot is way out of the midline base of support and it's pronating and it's dorsiflexing and inverting. And then you see the knee caving in as well. So you have an exhalation strategy and on top at the femoral component and an exhalation strategy at the tibial component. Let's apply the same principle to the first ray and the big toe. What you have is two exhalation strategies occurring simultaneously. The first ray is going to be more dorsiflexed and everted, and I'm going to see the same thing happen at the big toe. The big toe is also going to be more dorsiflexed and everted, and the combination, which is internal rotation at both of those locations, and when I have combined internal rotation at the first ray, and I have it at the big toe, the summation of those two forces and a loss of subsequent movement options is going to weaken the medial ligaments and structures on the side of the 
the, the big toe joint, creating that valgus deformity. Just like I see at the knee. I have internal rotation at the femur. I have internal rotation at the tibia. Do that long enough. You, see, you make that face long enough, as Ma said, it's going to stick that way. Same thing's going to happen with bunion formation. It's a combination of internal rotation at the first ray and internal rotation at the big toe or dorsiflexion eversion. Now, let's look at the foot situation that Andrew was talking about. Normally, you would think that a everted calcaneus or a pronated foot is going to create that situation. And it most certainly would because I have a situation where the first ray is going to be more dorsiflexed because it's being pushed into the ground by the calcaneus. And then you could have a subsequent dorsiflexion eversion action happening at the big toe. Hence, valgus collapse through the, the, the foot and a bunion formation on the inner aspect of the foot. That's pretty easy to see. And what would the fix be? Listen to the, the previous questions in the debrief. What about the situation where I have an inverted calcaneus? First thing, Andrew, is most people, even when they're non-weight bearing, or, or actually just about everyone when they're not weight bearing, the resting position of the foot is going to be in plantar flexion and inversion, so don't let that trip you up. But you could have a bunion on the big toe develop even if you have an inverted calcaneus. And why is that? The reason why that would be is if I, I can still have the first ray contact the ground. It would happen via plantar flexion though. But what could happen is if it drives in far enough, you could have a situation where you have some degree of AP compression at the first ray where I have a concentric orientation into plantar flexion, but I also have a restriction into dorsiflexion. That could, again, because that's my, that's my body's way of pronating the foot when I have a locked inverted calcaneus, that could drive me into a pronated state at the first ray. And subsequently, I could still have the dorsiflexion eversion action happening at the big toe. And that could still have a bunion form as a consequence. If I were to compare the two situations, a bunion formation with an everted calcaneus versus a bunion formation with an inverted calcaneus, the inverted situation would be several more compensatory actions happening than the person who just was plastered into that position to begin with. Because it's like you have a twist at the calcaneus and then I do a secondary twist at the, at the first ray and then I have a tertiary twist at the, at the forefoot. A lot of problems. With the, the everted calcaneus, you don't have as many twists. So what's the fix? Well, unfortunately, as I had alluded to in one of the previous questions, you're not going to necessarily change the structural things that happen at the foot. If you have a bunion forming, exercise isn't going to fix that because there are structural adaptations that have occurred. There's bony changes that have happened. And I, I, I really, I haven't seen any evidence to say you could reduce a bunion with exercise alone. I, and clinically, I haven't seen it happen either. And that's okay. Can you um, prevent a bunion from further happening? Again, I haven't seen any evidence to say that that's the case. It would make sense to me on a, on a mechanistic, st mechanistic standpoint that if I improve all of the movement options available and I don't have this bias into that double pronation situation, that possibly could be the case, but I can't say for sure. Really, the only fix of the deformity would be a surgical procedure. If you have pain that's associated with bunions, could you reduce some of the stresses in that area? Absolutely. I think that that's one thing that we could most certainly do. Um, and I, I've seen it happen many times. And, and you know, physical therapy and rehabilitation, that is a recommended part of care. Whether you do it operatively fix or you don't. That's really how you're going to fix these things. But if I want to improve the movement options, what I have to do is create an untwisting of those areas that are twisted in the foot. Just like we talked about when I have a person who's got a flat foot. It would be the exact same thing. You might do some changes at the big toe, but I've found that really rare. Still do your basic stuff, still do your stacking and all the things that you would normally do, but if I have an everted calcaneus, I've got to tip it back to center, use exercise to do that, use 
manual therapy, use wedges, use orthotics, use whatever you need to to be successful. And then what I might consider doing at the big toe, although let me preface again, I don't find that this needs to be done often. You could think about after you've corrected everything back to center, I could think about driving some first ray or some big toe plantar flexion. But again, that's a lot of cues and it's often not necessary. But you could think about sensing the big toe into plantar flexion. That might be a useful way of untwisting the foot. With the supinated or inverted calcaneus, the triple twist, great for ice cream, not for your foot. The triple twist would be driving pronation. So make sure you can evert the calcaneus. Feel your arch. You want to actually create some some dorsiflexion into the first ray because it plantar flex and that's, you know, you want to get it back to the primary compensation. And then what would you do with the big toe? From that position, think about doing dorsiflexion, which seems counterintuitive, but you're dorsiflexing the big toe in a different position than what you were starting in. Because I've untwisted all of the proximal structures, now I can actually achieve true dorsiflexion as opposed to compensatory dorsiflexion that I was exhibiting with the bunion formation. And that's what I would encourage you to do when we're talking about bunions. To summarize your great question, Andrew, bunion formation is going to happen when you have two pronation efforts at the first ray and the big toe joint, which would be dorsiflexion and eversion at both of those things. That's what creates the valgus collapse, much like you would see at the knee. The fix would be to create an untwist what you would do for that is address calcaneal position and then see how the first ray and the big toe shake out. That would be how you would restore movement options when you're seeing a valgus deformity. Is it going to fix the structure or slow down the processes? I don't know, probably not, especially if you've had the bony adaptations happen. What's really gonna fix the structure would likely be a surgical procedure, but that doesn't mean you can't help someone with pain. That doesn't mean you can't help someone move better and feel better. I think that's a good stopping point for us today. I want to thank all of you beautiful, sexy, outstanding people for tuning in. I'm thinking of all of you during these times, and I hope that uh, you know, it seems at least in some places there's a little bit of light at the end of the, end of the tunnel, so hopefully we can keep moving forward. If you want to learn more and consume some more material, if this interested you and you're like, man, I'd like to dive into some other areas like we talked about with the foot, or Zach, I don't know anything that you talked about. Where can I get a baseline? I would check out ZachCouples.com, my website. If you sign up for the newsletter, you will get access to the Human Matrix Foundations course. If you got a little lost in the lingo or you don't understand respiratory mechanics, it's free. Sign up for it. And best part, when you sign up through the newsletter, you'll get the Common Compensations Workbook, which is a way that you can look at improving your coaching and you can simplify a lot of the compensatory actions that you will see when you're coaching your people. If it's just two strategies and we can look at a squat and say they're using this strategy or this strategy, let's make the coaching simple as can be. I would start there. You'll also get five hours of talks, a free acute chronic workload calculator, lots of good stuff. I also offer a lot of different services if you want to kick it up a notch and be more specific because with all of the, the content that we're talking about, it's one thing to learn theory, it's another thing to learn the practical application of things and I have some ways of doing that. First, I have my seminar, Human Matrix. We are going to be resuming these in August, assuming that uh, we have life back to normal. The first one's gonna be in Boston, Massachusetts. Already got a few people signed up, so if you're, you're getting a little cabin fever and you're ready to make some moves and we are safe doing so, I'm hoping that that can happen. So definitely check me out at that. There's several others. I'll link them in the show notes. At Human Matrix, we will work on your ability to coach some of these things, really dive into the theory. You'll love it. If you want to dive into the movements for yourself, maybe you're toy and you're not moving as well as you like to, you got some boo-boos, you've ruled out the bad stuff, you've seen a bunch of people and you're like, man, Maybe I just need to move better and that would help me. A movement consultation can help you right from the comforts of your home. I will perform a full movement evaluation on you or your clients, whoever you need help with. We'll find your movement deficits. We will give you activities to improve those movement deficits and get you feeling better and performing the way you want. Or if you want to 
take that, but you want to apply it to a fitness perspective as well. You want to move well, but you got gains you want. You want your training to hike an hour without issues, whatever it is. I can help you with that as well. We take the same evaluation, apply and pick movements for you that maximize your fitness goals but respect your movement and capabilities. That's where my online training comes in. If you want to learn how to do the stuff that we've talked about with your people, you are a foot specialist and you're seeing a lot of foot stuff and it's like, wow, this sounds good, but I would really like some help on individual cases and I'd like someone to hold me accountable to work through these cases and make sure I'm applying the concepts that we discussed. That's where the mentorship program comes in. Please sign up for that. Once you've scoured ZachCouples.com, check me out on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. Search the Zach Couples Show because guess what, folks? There's 118 other debriefs. And, uh, you know, uh, you might not want to be, you know, YouTubing me while you're doing whatever it is you want to do while you're walking outside. Maybe you just want to listen to me. Keep me close. That's where I would definitely check me out. Please leave a review while you're there so the fam can keep growing. I'm also on social media, Facebook forward slash Z Couples. Twitter handle is at Z Couples. I'm on that Instagram, baby. Zach Z-A-C Couples, C-U-P-P-L-E-S. And last but not least, search me on YouTube. If you want to apply a gang of exercises that can help you restore your movement capabilities or your clients restore your movement capabilities or you want to see debriefs and all that other stuff, that's the place to go. I want to thank you all for tuning in. I hope you stay healthy and safe during these crazy times. Keep it real, but not to the extent where things go wrong. Stay hungry, stay learning, stay moving, and I'll see you next time. Deuces.